Okay, I'd like to introduce Shaya Ben Yuda, who is our Director of International Relations Division, to open this session. Good afternoon, Mr. Avner Shalev, Chairman of the Yad Vashem Directorate, Mr. Leonard Asper, CEO of the Anthem Media Group, His Excellency Dr. Samuel Pizar, Honorary Ambassador of UNESCO and Special Envoy for Holocaust Education, Mr. Natan Netan, Director General of Yad Vashem, Mrs. Dorit Novak, Director of the International School for Holocaust Studies, Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce the chairperson of this session, Mr. Leonard Asper, CEO of the Anthem Media Group and former CEO of Canwest Global Communication Corporation. We are pleased that Mr. Leonard Asper is with us for the closing session of this very successful biannual international conference on Holocaust education which you have been enjoying these last three days. This closing session of the International Conference is dedicated to the memory of Leonard's late parents, Izzy and Ruth, whom we knew as Babs Asper. Mr. Leonard Asper is here today representing the Asper family and the Asper Foundation, which became a partner of Yad Vashem and his international conference more than 10 years ago. I can recall my first meeting with these two great people, Izzy and Babs Asper, almost 11 years ago. They came to visit Yad Vashem in summer 2001, not long after we opened the new building for the International School for Holocaust Studies. It was before the new museum complex was constructed, and we could only share with them our vision, with vision regarding the Yad Vashem 2001 master plan, with, uh, which Avner initiated and started implementing during the 90s. I remember that we were sitting in the new building of the International School for Holocaust Studies, exchanging some ideas about the, challenging, the challenges we are facing, the future of Holocaust remembrance, the needs to fight anti-Semitism, and the hatred of all kinds. It was before the first Durban conference, which took place a few months later, and before September 11. With their long-term vision, Babs and Izzy, who was a media magnet and owner of a major media company, instinctively understood the importance of Holocaust education, a meaningful one, and the needs to combat anti-Semitism through education. They were both deeply committed to meaningful Holocaust remembrance and education in Canada and all over the world. Babs and Izzy decided to partner with Yad Vashem to establish the Asper International Holocaust Studies Program in 2002. The Asper Program supports seminars, outreach in English-speaking countries, the work of the ITF, and above all, this biannual international conference for Holocaust studies. I remember how pleased Babs and Izzy were when they participated in their first conference in 2002. Unfortunately, only a year later, Izzy passed away. And at the next conference in 2004, we began to dedicate the special closing session of the conference in his memory. We are very saddened to be marking the closing session this year in memory of both. 
Izzy and his loving wife, Babs, after her sudden passing away last July. Their noble legacy lives on in their various and very successful initiative in Holocaust education in Canada, at Yad Vashem, and through the constructions of the new Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Canada. We here at Yad Vashem held the Aspers and their vision in deep regards and appreciation, and we continue to work closely with the Asper family and Asper Foundation. <clears throat> the next generation of dedicated philanthropists and partners with Yad Vashem in our ongoing shared commitment to Holocaust education. I am delighted to welcome Leonard Asper, the son of Babs and Izzy Asper, and CEO of Anthem Media to Yad Vashem. Leonard was appointed Vice Chair of the Asper Foundation this March. I'm honored to invite Leonard to give his opening remarks at this closing session in memory, memory of his dear parents. Leonard, please. Well, you're down to two more speeches before you are free. Thank you very much, Jaya, for that wonderful introduction of my parents. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak with you today as part of this closing session of the 8th International, International, 8th International Educators Conference on Holocaust Education. I hope you would all agree that the last few days have been incredible and valuable for you. The conference, as usual, perhaps even more so this year, I'm told, has provided great insight into the challenges and opportunities of Holocaust education in the 21st century. As uh, Shia mentioned, this session is being held in memory of my parents, Dr. Israel Asper Alav HaShalom and Babs Asper Alava HaShalom. They were founders of the Asper Foundation in 1983. I'd like to also bring greetings on behalf of the staff and trustees of the Asper Foundation, the chairman, my brother David, uh, and the president, my sister Gail, executive director, Mo Levy, and our senior program manager, Jeff Morey, as well as uh, Shai Abramson, who is, uh, works with us here in Israel, uh, managing many of our projects here, and very well, very ably so. Shai? So you probably know by now the Asper Foundation is a very strong and consistent supporter of Holocaust and human rights education. We understand and we appreciate that the Holocaust was the defining historical event and catalyst that prompted the birth of the modern human rights movement. Without an understanding of the depth and the breadth of the Holocaust and the millennia of anti-Semitism that preceded it and which allowed it to happen, people can't appreciate the human rights abuses that are taking place today all over the world. More importantly, they will not have enough knowledge without the understanding of how it happened to be able to prevent the abuses that are taking place all over the world. The area of Holocaust education has always been relevant, but its significance in the last few years has been even more pronounced with the waning number of survivors, increasing Holocaust denial and revisionism, and then growing anti-Semitism, which, which is cloaked by some and tightly wound up in the delegitimization of the State of Israel. So at the Asper Foundation, we focus on three major initiatives. The first, of course, is this seminar and this conference that you, uh, you have here, and that's the base of our wonderful relationship with Yad Vashem. My father proudly announced the establishment of this program a decade ago. It's funded by income from a $4 million fund set up by our foundation, which is used for the expansion of programs at Yad Vashem's International School for Holocaust Studies. My father said when he announced this program, the, the Asper Foundation is proud to play an integral, integral role in supporting Yad Vashem, a world-renowned institution restrict, respected not only for commemorating the victims of the Holocaust, but imparting the lessons of the Holocaust and educating people worldwide to help ensure that the rally cry, never again, not only refers to Jews, but to all peoples. 
I know he felt deeply that Yad Vashem was the premier institution and world repository for Holocaust victims and one of the key global educational institutions attempting to inoculate people from racism and hatred. We've been very, very pleased, that more, more than I can possibly express today, with the progress of this program and how big it's become and how important it's become and the difference it's making. So I want to thank today Avner Shalev, Shia Ben Yehuda, Jane Jacobs Kimmelman, and their team, whose incredible vision and tremendous leadership have made this program the great success that it is. And we can't, of course, forget Rochelle Bud Kaplan, who's also made significant contributions in the past to this program. The second of our initiatives in Holocaust education and human rights-related education is our, is our Human Rights and Holocaust Studies program that we run in Canada, that Shia referred to. This, was, this was, uh, uh, had its inception in 1997 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, our home, 500 miles north of Minneapolis, so you can imagine how cold that is. It's become, but it's become one of Canada's largest educational in initiatives, reaching 10,500 students in Canada, and chaperones as well, that go in 118 cities in all 10 provinces and two territories. This program aims to pr promote and sensitize Canadian high school students to the consequences of racism. It's much broader than a Holocaust studies program. It, start, it started in the, in the Jewish schools, but quickly when people saw how fantastic it was, we, other schools from Christian schools and public schools generally and many Aboriginal schools in, in Canada all asked to join in or eagerly joined when it was presented to them. In this program, there's an 18-hour education program on human rights and the Holocaust. And once that's completed, the students then participate in a trip to Washington to see the Holocaust Museum there. They spend several days in the city of Washington visiting not only the Holocaust Museum, but also important monuments relating to human rights and freedom. That extraordinary success caused my father to wake up one day and say, why are we sending 10,000 students to Washington? Why do we have nothing in Canada? And thus was born the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which is our third initiative in Holocaust and human rights education. He was shocked that Canada, which doesn't have a perfect human rights record either, did not have a place where its stories were told and which also told the stories of the world. Nowhere in Canada was there a place where the context in which the Holocaust happened was exposed, where it was memorialized, and where it was also used as a teaching tool, as we do here at Yad Vashem. So the Asper Foundation began the process of developing the Human Rights Museum, and it was finally declared a national museum by the Harper government in 2008, and it will open in 2014. The museum has made groundbreaking history because it will be the largest human rights institution and center for education in the world today. It's a $305 million structure, and it will incorporate the largest Holocaust gallery in Canada. The museum content will also be world class, of course, because not only did it consult with Yad Vashem, but the other major designer of the content is none other than Ralph Applebaum, who also designed the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. This museum will explore the subject of human rights, and its purpose is to promote understanding and respect, encourage dialogue and reflection, but most importantly, action. So now at the Asper Foundation, we have the, we're into the, the second generation of trustees. We're bound by our mandate, our document, to support Israel, which we do in many ways, from the Hebrew University to running small business camps, uh, for Arab women in East Jerusalem, to having community action centers, which Shai is so much a part of here, uh, that help uh, disadvantaged children uh, in Israel. But no written mandate can ever be as powerful as the strong collective love of Israel that we have in our, in our hearts and our minds at the Asper Foundation, and how much we will continue to support this. Not only, uh, not only the, the Asper trustees themselves, but also the executives and the people back in Winnipeg who work there. I first came to Israel in 1974 when soldiers were still roaming the, ro roaming the roads 
and tanks still littered the roadside from the 1973 Yom Kippur War. I fell in love with this country when I read the book Exodus, and then the book Menachem Begin's The Revolt, and finally Abram Sacker's History of Israel. Whether you're from Europe or from Africa, it's an incredible place. It's an incredible place to learn. I hope you've learned not only about Holocaust education here, but also about the country as well. There are many important institutions in this country, but few are as important in defining Israel, preserving its history, but also securing its future than Yad Vashem. So I will conclude by saying thanks again to Yad Vashem and the fantastic team here that put on this wonderful conference. While the physical structure of Yad Vashem is vital, it's the programming, it's the content, it's what happens here that is even more important. So thank you very much to all of you. Your work is incredibly important, it is needed, and we wish you many more years of this to come. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard, and thank you for your generosity. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce our speaker who will give the closing address, Dr. Samuel Pizal, international attorney, author, Holocaust survivor, honorary ambassador of UNESCO, special envoy for Holocaust education, and founder and first president of Yad Vashem Society in France. Dr. Pizal. Uh oh. Okay. You have on your you have on your seats Kaddish and the text. We're about to hear the opening of that symphony. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, this is my personal Kaddish, inspired by the noble prayer of antiquity and written for the monumental symphony composed by Leonard Bernstein, a beloved friend and a kindred soul who wanted my living testimony, drawn from the lowest depth of human suffering to resonate in your kingdom with his celestial music. Mine is a layman Scottish father, contemporary, universal, and dedicated to all your tormented children, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and all others, Believers and non-believers, yearning for peace, freedom, and justice in our fratricidal and suicidal world. I utter this lament with grief and anger welled up from my own traumatic past and the deluge of hatred, violence, and fear that is engulfing us again. On every continent, hereditary enemies mired in terror, bigotry, and despair are at each other's throats. Even in your holy land, where they worship the same God and implore you to turn their swords into plowshares. I weep for them all, the living as well as the dead. My first tears are for my family. 
for my family and my people, perpetual victims of religious and ethnic persecution that reached its historic climax in my childhood, destroying everyone and everything around me, while you, supreme ruler of the universe, stood idly by. Equally indifferent were you when I agonized in Auschwitz, Majdanek, and Dachau, where Eichmann and Mengele's gruesome reality eclipsed Dante's vision of Inferno. Today, I am haunted by guilt for having survived when six million were murdered. Now I must atone for the ritual mourner's Kaddish I could never recite because I had no dates of their demise. No closure, no Shiva, no graves for a stone, a flower, prayer, a prayer for their redemption. Iskadal ve Iskadash Shmei Rabba. I still remember my grandmother's sweet voice singing me a lullaby about how good, how loving, how merciful a God you are how you would always be there to comfort me in need. I have often tried to summon her voice when I needed your comfort. That sweet voice, so cruelly silenced in the ovens of Treblinka. The memory of my grandmother's lullabies has always soothed me to sleep even when I became an adult. But in my dreams, all I could see were her eyes, raised in prayer to you, as the monster took her away. Iskadal, we iskadash, shmei rabba. Father, Father, do you recall that wondrous spring dawn when the American GIs descended like angels from heaven to rescue me from hell. I was still a boy, alone in the cauldrons of Hitler's Europe, like the young Joseph in the dungeons of Pharaoh's Egypt. But from that moment on, I no longer felt abandoned because your godliness became so sublimely humane. You performed dazzling miracles on a biblical scale, delivering the enslaved, the oppressed, and the dispersed from the clutches of tyranny to rebuild your temple. You performed miracles for me too rekindling from the ashes my weak flicker of life and making me soar like a phoenix. You opened my shattered mind to the magic of knowledge, culture, and beauty. You even taught me how to love and dream again. Above all, Father, you blessed me with a new and happy family, with children and grandchildren whose sparkling faces and sterling characters resurrect for me every day the memory of those I have lost. One day, 
may they say Kaddish for me. Thus, O oh great and unique God of Abraham, it is with respect for the beliefs of all and with malice to none that I bow toward the eternal Jerusalem, its synagogue, churches, and mosques to sing for you from Yad Vashem this hallowed memorial to the innocent martyrs and righteous heroes of the Shoah, my fervent prayer of hope, drawn from torrents of blood, bond with us again, Lord. Guide us towards reconciliation, tolerance, brotherhood, and peace on this small, divided, fragile planet, our common home. Amen. Amen. Amen.
excellencies, professors, fellow survivors, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and a great pleasure to be able to address such a noble international assembly in eternal Jerusalem where all the children of Abraham and all others, believers and non-believers, feel closer to God than anywhere else on this planet. <clears throat> the filmed fragments of Leonard Bernstein's monumental symphony you have just heard and seen for which I have written and narrated the libretto Kaddish, my own Kaddish, with the Israeli and many other renowned orchestras all over the world, may have also transported you for an instant closer to heaven. But now I must bring you back to earthly reality. I think you have understood that in a certain way the individual with the chutzpah to call the Almighty to account is really the orphan skeletal adolescent boy with shaved head and sunken eyes, trembling at the threshold of a Birkenau gas chamber and blaspheming outrage, outrage against the cruelty of his fellow man and the indifference of his beloved creator. That little boy still inhabits this ambassador and lawyer with PhDs from Harvard and the Sorbonne that I have become in my new incarnation. It is he who is far more interesting to listen to than myself, who is telling the story if I may use the name of your conference. He is telling the story. And I, the international busybody, am helping to teach the core. Dear friends, Gatherings like this that build the record, search for the meaning, and teach the essence of the Holocaust are currently becoming events of crucial, even existential importance for Jews and non-Jews alike. Because we, the last remaining, the last living survivors of that greatest catastrophe ever perpetrated by humans against humans are now disappearing one by one. After we are gone, history will speak about it all with the impersonal voice of scholars and novelists, and at worst, in the malevolent register of deniers and falsifiers, this process has already begun. The challenge before you, the challenges, because they are many, 
are therefore vast and complex. And your admirable commitment to meet them are, I believe, fueled by the growing perception in all over the world that the Shoah in our newly inflamed post-September 11 era is evolving and it must evolve from a unique Jewish tragedy to a warning of urgent and universal proportions. Since my return from Auschwitz, Majdanek and Dachau, from which I was liberated by an armored column of American GIs in the wake of the Normandy landings, an endless eruption of genocides, ethnic cleansings, and other mass atrocities, far from banalizing and trivializing the Holocaust, confirmed its fundamental revelation. And this is no less and no more than that man remains basically flawed, capable of the worst as of the best, of hatred as of love, of madness as of genius. In short, that the unthinkable, the unimaginable, is again possible with plagues of toxic gas, nuclear mushroom clouds, and ballistic missiles in the murderous hands of new tyrants and fanatics. Yet contemporary demagogues, some of them with nuclear ambitions, who kill and maim innocents at random, including their own long-suffering kin, still persist in calling the Holocaust a myth and in threatening to wipe out Israelis and other vulnerable peoples they consider as adversaries. If such somber reflections seem to me relevant today, it is because the ashes of Auschwitz speak to all of us, Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, about the present and the future no less than about the past. Indeed, in those ashes, we can discern the specter of apocalyptic doomsday and a nagging call to vigilance in the face of the un unmanageable turmoil of our time. That problematic must also enter within the scope of our preoccupations here for the sake of the dead that we must continue to lament and for the sake of the living that we must protect, be they Jews or Gentiles of various stripes. For last year's International Holocaust Day, the anniversary, I returned to Auschwitz at the behest of the so-called Project Aladdin, 
that was launched by the French Foundation for the Memory of the Shoah, where I am a board member, and UNESCO, where I am an ambassador, some 200 Jewish, Muslim, and Christian leaders, including heads of state, chief rabbis, grand muftis, and eminent cardinals from all continents attended that commemoration with me. And at that cursed and sacred spot where I once suffered endless tortures and humiliations, where I saw the barge of human civilization go under, my mission was to bear witness, to bear witness in the name of the martyrs and the survivors, that far from being a myth, the Holocaust constitutes a supreme alert for all mankind of horrors that may still lie ahead. Surrounded by the mind-boggling evidence that was staring us in the face there at Birkenau, united by common pain and by shared moral values, that unlikely assembly managed for once to transcend all political, racial, and religious strife and to pray together for a safer and better future. All of them seem to reject the cynical allegations that what we had endured in body and soul never happened. They also seemed to approve when I meditated aloud that such slanders are unworthy of people who purport to worship the same Abrahamic God. Following that rare moment, and I am giving you what seems to be a new insight following that rare moment of interfaith solidarity, I was invited to lead a group of the participants to testify before the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the U.S. House of Representatives, where similar sentiments prevailed. And there, standing with me, the Grand Mufti of Bosnia, Dr. Mustafa Tzerik, who was with all of us for the pilgrimage to both Auschwitz and Washington, repeated the moving declaration he had made in the ruins of the crematoria for the benefit of his own co-religionists and for the rest of us. I quote, he said, I came here to see the evil that humans can do to humans and to say that those who deny the Holocaust and the genocide of Srebrenica are committing Holocausts themselves. These are strong and unexpected words that are likely to have a future. Of course, 
I am fully aware that two nightingales, two nightingales do not make a spring, particularly an Arab spring. But the unexpected encounters have strengthened within me the hope for an eventual stabilization and with luck an eventual reversal of the alarming trend that is now pushing us, all of us, toward the fateful crossroads. Either we will regress into another dark age of unmitigated terror, geopolitical chaos, and economic disaster, or the human adventure will resume. Will resume and continue with new leaps of imagination, innovation, creativity, that can mobilize the enthusiasm and energies of younger generations everywhere. Permit me to add that no one can live what I have lived in the lowest depth and on a few summits of the human condition without grasping for a coherent, constructive vision of the future, without alerting the young to the accumulation of dangers which threaten to destroy their world as they once destroyed mine. And on that optimistic note, let me say that after my comeback from the valley of death, I have learned, I have written, and I have even announced in my lecture a few decades ago at the 50th anniversary of the celebration of the Technion in Haifa that there is a promising, beckoning horizon for humanity between heaven and earth. That there is another path, a path to extirpate the poisonous hatred among peoples and tribes which consider themselves enemies forever. That the path to peaceful coexistence and cooperation is paved with the inexhaustible resources of the gray matter that is located in the human skull and which belongs in equal measure to all races, colors, and creeds, to Asians as to Europeans, to Russians as to Americans, to Arabs as to Jews. Expose young people mired in misery, bigotry, and terror to the treasures of modern knowledge, information, and know-how, agricultural, industrial, scientific, cultural. Expose them to all that, and they will discover the wisdom and audacity of our predatory ancestors when they emerged from the darkness of their caves and open up a new era of peace, tolerance, and prosperity. Meanwhile, we hesitate, we vacillate like sleepwalkers at the edge of the abyss but the irrevocable has not yet happened. Our chances are still intact. It is people 
of intelligence, conscience, and compassion like you, the leaders of this remarkable institute, and all the others who have come here from 54 countries as your guests, who must help humankind seize these chances before it is too late. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we began this conference on time, and I promise you that we will end at exactly 6 o'clock. And I am going to take these last five minutes for a few words. Mishlei Perek Aleph Pasuk Yud Chet Kibarov Chochma Rav Kaas Viosif Da'at Yosef Machov, Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastics chapter 1, verse 18. For in much wisdom is much, much vexation, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. I hope these last few days that we have all increased our knowledge. This knowledge has made us uncomfortable. It has also been painful. And we have seen man's inhumanity to man and man's inhumanity to the Jews. I want to believe that this knowledge that we have gained will make us all more sensitive to each other, that this will give us the strength to combat the evils that exist in our respective societies, and that we will all do our best to pass on this history to our students around the globe and to make this history relevant to their lives wherever they may be. It is my tradition from conference to conference to say thank you to the many people that have been involved in making this last three days a success. Avner, I'm going to begin with you. Avner Shalev. The chairman of the Avisham Directorate. Avner, you are a man of vision. And it's your vision over the last two decades here at Yad Vashem that has put education as one of the major priorities of this institution. As a result of this vision, Yad Vashem has become a world center for Holocaust education, research, and commemoration, the building of the International School for Holocaust Studies, the addition of the new international wing is a result of your vision. This is unprecedented in any other Holocaust museum or center throughout the world. We thank you for that vision. Natan is sitting over here in the corner, very quiet. Natan Eitan, our Director General. Natan, it's your smile. It's both engaging and motivating. Your engaging personality has made it a pleasure to work with you on this conference. Your ability to think of every possible angle, any problem that may arise, and to find the best solutions is a testament to how smoothly this conference has run over the last three days. <laughs> Dorit Novak, my boss, the director of the International School for Holocaust Studies. Dorit, I have to admit I'm disappointed. 
but I have to tell you why. We were organizing the July 2008 conference. You had a large A4 notebook, and you wrote everything down. It drove fear into my heart. What has to be done, what's planned, what we haven't done. When we began organizing this conference, you took out a small notebook, a tiny small notebook. And I asked you, doesn't this conference deserve a large notebook? I don't remember your answer. But when I left your room, the dime dropped. That small notebook represented to me your total trust, faith, and confidence in myself and my entire conference team that we said 350 people would come, 364 people came at the end of the day. I want to thank you for that small notebook. Our deputy director of the school, Karanit, she hates it when I embarrass her. But thank you for all of your help in organizing the school staff and the resources of the school. And a special thanks, where's Effie Levy? Where's Effie? A special thanks to Effie, who helped to take, to take over and help organize all the last details in organizing this conference. Shulamit, our pedagogical director. Shunamit and I have now been working together at the school for two and a half decades. Don't ask how old we are. When we first began organizing this conference, it was clear to the organizing team exactly what we wanted to do, our objectives, our goals, our rationale. It was clear to all of us. Let's recruit graduates from all over Europe, Thank you, Yael Yigelstein, helping us with the moderators, the learning day, our pedagogical day. Salid Hochmakovic from our Israeli teacher training department in helping us recruit Jewish educators. Benjamin Yariv, our transportation officers that made sure you got here every day and got back safely in, safely out. Remember. Nama Sheikh from our inter internet department all of our worker bees were instrumental in helping us put together all of my materials. Jane, thank you very much for international relations. Shana that kept us with our budget, keeping us on track, exactly what we could spend and couldn't spend. A special thanks to Tal Ronen, who works as the assistant to our director many times solving what seemed to be the most unsolvable problems that we were faced with. Didi Tzhak in Lior, he's sitting in the back there from our maintenance team from the school. Thank you very much for making everything run very smoothly, including the SAMI team. The different department heads, Rochale, Barkai, who helped us organize the beautiful moving ceremony on Monday night. Uh, thank you for that. Iris Rosenberg, our spokesperson, Esti Ifat. Our, our information technology department, we had to work with this new computer program, a CRM, Adina. Thank you very much to Tomer, Michael Lieber, Dr. Chaim Gerde from the head of our archives. Thank you, Chaim. Shaya Ben Yudah that's sitting here from International Relations Division. And our maintenance people, Dor, who have been trying to keep the air conditioning bearable. But the last and most profound gratitude I owe is to my conference team. I have been blessed by an extremely dedicated, passionate, and determined team in organizing this conference. It would have been impossible without you. Where is Dorit Raviv? Please stand up. Dorit. I cannot say 
enough glowing praises of your passion, the endless hours, your determination to make sure no email got lost, you went to the right hotels, you are, come, you, are, you are actually staying in my department, and thank you for staying with us and becoming a permanent member of the K-Team. We appreciate that. <laughs> to our other members, Coral, I've been practicing to say your name properly. Thank you for all the help over the last five months in the department and in helping organize this conference. To Nuit and the Aussie delegation that we have with us, Eliana and Chaya helping us with our Latin American uh, delegation. Where is Stephanie? Where is Stephanie? Okay, Stephanie, first of all, you're my beshert. But no less important, my best friend. Steffi, thank you for the name of this conference, the structure of this conference. It is brilliant. Thank you for the endless hours, both day and night, of listening, advising, and helping. The last group of people I want to thank are you. The 364 participants from 54 different countries that made the great schlep to come to Israel, to Jerusalem, to here at Yad Vashem. We thank you for your commitment to Holocaust education. We hope that you will return home recharged, invigorated, with new food for thought, and continue to teach this important history and to make it relevant to your students around the globe. We hope to see you in 2014 at our ninth international conference. Thank you very much.